All right, we'll get uh, started with our next talk of the day. Our presenter is Malcolm Tredinick. Malcolm has been a Linux user since 1993 and contributed his first acknowledged open source patch whilst trying to fix a build bug in 1996. An active GNOME contributor in the first half of this decade, these days the bulk of his community contributions go towards the Django project and Python community in general. So please welcome Malcolm. So it's um, interesting what happens between when you submit an abstract six months ago when you sit down and write the talk. This isn't quite the talk I set out to, to give because I realized it's not, you know, it would be too confusing. But it's still gonna be, you know, the abstract isn't a complete pile of lies. Um, so let's, you know, see what happens. What, what, what I'd like to do here, my goal, if I succeed today, you will learn nothing because I'd really just like to give a sort of eye-opening talk that you already know all this stuff. It's kind of common for, for professional programmers, you're already using a lot of these functional programming techniques and it's sort of good, considered good practice and it's just not being called that. And really what I wanna do is sort of just point out, you know, there's a whole other, a whole other set of names and a whole other set of group of people, often in academia, but who are sort of thinking about this stuff and here's directions to go and look with a few small examples of how this has been used in practice and um, why you already know this. You know, hopefully a, a not too confusing tri trip through things you're already doing day to day. The first sort of question is, you know, functional programming seems trendy, it comes up a lot, but what the hell is it, right? Why is it, what, what makes something functional programming? And this sort of, the Wikipedia definition is not, completely insane. Basically, a, a programming style structured around calling functions, calling mathematical functions, giving it a, a set of inputs, getting back a, always returning something as an answer. Avoiding state and mutable data, by and large, not universally true, but generally true, particularly avoiding state. So the whole idea here is the, every, every function is a computational box. You, you give it a bunch of data, it always gives you back something. You're not calling it for the side effects, you're not calling it for because it changes something. The, the sort of comparison counterpoint is something like take object-oriented programming, sort of Java classes or something like that, Python, Python objects, where often you have a, a bag of goo that stores some state and every method on these objects somehow alters the state or adds some data to this, this bag of goo. And so there the whole point of methods is changing the internal state, changing, changing the data. Functional programming is a lot more, you give, it, you give it everything it needs to go, it gives you back an answer, and it remembers nothing. There's sort of some nice benefits here. It makes analyzing the programs a lot easier because you can, every time you give it the same data, you should get back the same answer. Um, there's some perhaps performance benefits because if you had perfect future predictable ability, you could cache the answer. You go, okay, every time they pass in this set of data to this function, it gives back this answer, and I'm gonna need that again in the future. In practice, that's a little bit harder. You can't cache everything that you pass to a function every time you call a function if you're passing data because memory isn't infinite. So where do you make the trade-off? But you, know, you, can do, you can do reasonable things. Side effect free is kind of the goal, but it's, you know, if you look at things squinty-eyed, you can sort of convince yourself that, yes, yeah, everything's side effect free. But how do you print stuff out? How do you read data in? There's, you know, every, every true functional programming language has to work around this, this problem of, you actually need to talk to your users. You need to accept input, you need to write output. And they all have different ways around it. Some are not so, um, not quite so pure. They do have side effects somehow, some sort of IO methods. Haskell has this um, scheme of things called monads that allow you to um, sort of carry around the state in particular for input output. They have this big object that you can basically think of as the state of the world. And so if you always call this function with the, the state of the world being the same, you would get back the same answer, except the state of the world is never the same and so you always get different answers and it's you know, considered not cheating. But you kind of have to look at it a little bit. You kind of have to squint a little bit because you know, you're writing to disk, something might change, or you're reading config variables in. Something will change the next time around. It's not completely side effect free to reread the same disk file. So, you know, I, that's why I say minimal side effects here. And, and, and a nice sort of functional programming methodology is you get all your side effects stuff, read config files, get user input, whatever, get it out of the way once up front, 
and then you basically draw the line and say, okay, from here on in, no side effects, and then over here, I'm going to do some output. There's always the sort of functional programming languages and even you know, real world procedural programming languages divide themselves a bit into when do the arguments get evaluated? If you pass multiple arguments into a function and if these arguments are not just primitive objects like integers or something, if you pass the result of another function call into a function, when does it actually get evaluated? Um, and various language specs sort of specify when the arguments get evaluated and they, they always say, you know, C language spec for example always happens left to right. Some languages don't say, which means that if you pass in the same, the same argument multiple places, you get interesting effects. Um, some languages, like Haskell, will say, okay, lazy evaluation. We won't evaluate the argument until we need it inside the function, which means if you pass in a, if you have a function that takes two arguments and always returns the first argument, the second argument will never get evaluated because it's just not needed. Um, and so it's, it's basically evaluate on reference. And this, this means, you know, you can pass in infinite lists, for example. You can happily pass around infinite lists in a lot of lazy evaluated languages because it doesn't need to evaluate the whole list. It only needs to evaluate as many um, values from the list as it needs. So there's a lot, of, a lot of fairly common idioms in functional programming languages that look like apply this function to this infinite list. And if you've sort of just been doing C or Java or something like this, your brain derails slightly and you go, but wait, that's not coming back. And you try it out in the interactive prompt, and sure enough, your machine just locks up, printing out the infinite list. But in practice, you never actually want to, that's the side effect of trying to print out the list. You, you don't actually need to evaluate it all. Other languages, ML, for example, they, functional programming languages will happily evaluate, their, they will evaluate their arguments eagerly, like on the spot when it's called, um, which puts a few more limitations on what you can actually pass into these things. It has the trade-off that, if, if I'm passing around arguments that aren't being evaluated, I need to somehow sort of have a data structure that says, here's what to do when I need to evaluate this argument. For example, here's an infinite list. Um, and here's how to construct the next element of the list that I'm up to. I, I have the first 10, here's how to make number 11. They're called thunks quite often. And these are, you know, they're computational units. They're, they're bits of code that say how to produce the next value. And if you're passing these around all the time, you can actually end up using quite a chunk of memory because of all these unevaluated thunks that one day I might need this argument. I can't yet prove that I don't need this, so I can't throw it away yet. With eager evaluation, you can happily evaluate the argument, you get it down to a single primitive value, an integer or a string or what have you, and then that's all the memory you need to store. So there are trade-offs both ways, and most languages that have lazy evaluation of arguments will also have some kind of short circuit thing that you can tell it, please eagerly evaluate this right now. I don't need you, I don't need you to delay, I know I'm gonna need it, or I'm actually doing this for some crazy side effect. Um, and so evaluate it right now. And this, this is a, a fairly common sort of development project for development methodology for large functional programming languages. You write it all neat and tidy and your university professor will be proud. You run it and you run it out of memory. Then you go back and look at the things you can evaluate eagerly to sort of bring down the memory footprint a bit and go from there. But lazy evaluation is, is fairly important and what I'll get to in a minute when I'm talking about this in sort of more real world situations. I think the application here is very large data sets. You don't want to read in the whole data set at once. So infinite lists is a good example, but you can think of more realistic examples. For example, a copy of every page on the web or something. Look, the very next slide. So our sort of standard, we're at a point in computing history where you know we have very fast machines, multiple, multiple cores or multiple CPUs. We can happily, simple grid computing, even complicated grid computing is well within the grasp of everyone here in the audience. Like, you know, pay a bit of money to Amazon or something and you can have access to multiple machines. We can churn over ridiculously huge data sets just for fun. This wasn't really a practical option 20 years ago because how do you get the darn data set? How do you store it, let alone receive it in the first place? Now you can happily, EC2, for example, has a whole bunch of data sets available that are just too big to necessarily slope over the internet to this part of the world. But 20 gigabytes of data or something sitting over there for you to happily load on a machine and, and run through if you want to, is everyone can do it. Which means we have to be rethinking the way we're processing these things, because the first step is not read in big bunch of honking data to an array. Um, it's a lot of memory. So if I can't read in all of the data all at once, I need to be a, bit, a little bit smarter because I can't suddenly be doing algorithms that are just random access over this data. It's not sort of uncommon to see, you, you ask someone 
you know, how would I sort, I don't know, I have a list of names and tax file numbers or something, and I want to find anyone who has a duplicate tax file number with somebody else. Okay, this is you know, name maps to 10 digit number, social security number for people from North America. Okay, read in the list and sort it. Works well for maybe a few million entries. Gets kind of funky when you start doing population of China. Um, you know, these, these things are bigger. You need to, we need to get a little bit smarter about processing these things. And this leads to a, a sort of a, a class of algorithms that um, are often called online algorithms, which is kind of a confusing name. Got, not, got nothing to do with the traditional meaning of online. It's just algorithms that ha always have a valid result while they're reading in data. You don't have to read in the whole data set in order to be able to, to see the result. Examples of this are, suppose you have a whole bunch of points in a graph and you're trying to work out, can this graph be embedded in a plane? So can I draw the graph without having any lines crossing over each other? Uh, this is sort of valid in the, in the real world if I'm laying out a printed circuit board or I'm trying to do um, paths of a robot in a warehouse or something. It's not always so cool if they're crossing paths because that leads to interesting collisions. They're, the really good, the really fast algorithms in this sort of area can run in reasonably, reasonably quick time. They used to be ridiculous, but now they're, I can't remember the exact order of complexity, but it's sensible within the, within the sort of number of points you might have. But even better, the good ones these days are online algorithms. So I can just keep reading in one point after another. And at any point, if I get something, the subset of points that I've read in so far, I know that graph is planar embeddable or it's not planar embeddable. I don't have to read in all of the points and then do some computation to work out if it is. I can just read in one point at a time and, and um, see, okay, I can, still, I can still embed this in a plane. I can still embed this in a plane. I can still embed this in a plane. It might be a different embedding each time, but I can do one point at a time. Similarly with building up trees for searching, um, being able to read the, the fast, there's always, a, there's always a slow way to do an, a, a, an online algorithm, which is read in all the points you've got, save up all the data so far, and then just run from the beginning to the end for, for the points you've got so far. Read in the next point, and then just run from the beginning again. Unfortunately, that adds a whole extra factor of n to your multiple of n to the complexity of the algorithm. So when I say an online algorithm, I mean something that runs as fast as the fastest algorithm in this area, so you know, in log n for planarity testing or um, the total length of the words. If, you, if you're putting all the, or a whole bunch of words into a suffix tree for rapid searching against a corpus of text, the sort of order of complexity there is the total length of all the words. Um, and there is actually an online algorithm to do that as well. But you know, as I only have to process the first half of the dictionary, I already have all those in the suffix tree, adding the next word only adds the length of that next word worth of time. Um, sometimes online algorithms are not like a, a sort of common example we come across even at the sort of university level is if you have a heap, which is you know, a sorted tree structure where um, the root element is the, the largest element in the tree. And so everything below, everything below that is smaller than the real element. It's not necessarily sorted like a binary tree where everything on the left is smaller than everything on the right or anything like that. But it's just, it's an easy way to pull off the maximum element. Creating a heap one element at a time, put an element in, put the next element in, make sure that's a heap, put the next element in, make sure that's a heap, is actually slower if you've got like, you know, a lot of elements than putting all of them in at once, unsorted, and then just turning it back into a heap by using the environment. It's a you know, factor of n or something slower to do the online version there. So there are cases, you know, online algorithms are not a given. It's normally a big, a big win in the, in the algorithm stakes to actually get an online algorithm. And it's a, it's a big deal when you've got very large data sets. And I sort of hinted at, like, this kind of comes to the, the crux of my, of my talk here, is the big deal when doing functional programming, and the next sort of few slides cover this, is it's about data structures. And it's about finding a good data structure for the, um, the work you're doing, rather than rather than immediately leaping into a problem and going, how am I going to run through this? What steps am I going to do to change this? It's worthwhile thinking about what sort of data structure can I put these things into so that I don't have to know the whole data structure at once or so that I can easily construct the data structure and only look at a very small section of the data structure. I think you know, three-dimensional data structure, for example, or two-dimensional data structure to make it easier. I think you've only got a very small window that you're allowed, to, you're allowed to look at at any point because if you look at much more, you might have to suck in data that you don't have in memory yet or might be on the other side of the planet or what have you. So. Trees tend to fall out surprisingly often. Trees, graphs, lists, sets, what have you. 
linked list are the obvious one, like, you know, everyone's favorite data structure that doesn't seem to be as useful as you thought when you started using it, the old singly linked list, very easy to create. Just a simple example of a tree, so let's skip over that and just go straight to trees. And I don't mean necessarily just binary trees here, it could have any number of children attached to the parent. You know, there's, a, there's a surprisingly large number of, of problems where the secret is working out how to put it into a tree. And part of that is because we have a ridiculously large number of algorithms that operate very nicely on trees. And particularly if you can put it into binary trees, you know, traversal algorithms that go down depth first search or um, bread first, uh, not bread first, that's a little bit inefficient, but you know, pre-order, post-order, in-order searching of trees is, comes up so often it's not funny. And I, gu I guess that would be one of, the, one of the things next time you're sort of, I don't want to do this prescriptive, but I find as, I, as I'm wrestling with sort of large data structure problems and I'll often go, you know, this is really getting pretty intractable in the code. How do I, how can I make this simpler? I'm sort of losing track of what's going on. It usually becomes a lot of step back and go, okay, what, what am I actually doing here data structure wise? And often I'll find I've got, a, I've got a class that has maybe an attribute for the data I'm processing and then a bunch of other attributes that are holding sort of temporary state. Um, so sort of here's what I'm up to in the algorithm. And more often than not, it turns out to be, I can really simplify that data structure by putting it into a graph or putting it into a tree. So I go, I'm somewhere, how do I move to the next state in this data? How do I move to the next bit of data? Trees are nice because they tend to be hierarchical. If you can somehow put an ordering on your data, you can put it into a tree, you can put it into a heap. Not all data is necessarily, has a, has a strict ordering like that. Cycles crop up a fair bit. Um, graphs and sets sort of show up more often than trees sometimes. Sets, you know, sets show up a lot. Like I, all I'm talking about here is just a, an unordered collection of points with no, no necessarily relation between them, just the fact that these points exist. But again, it often turns out to be useful to just think of a set as a, as a tree or a graph because if there's no relation between them, you're not actually losing any information by putting a relation between them. Just connect them randomly, right? At this point, any, any sort of graph traversal algorithm at this point will work. Um, you can't necessarily put them in a tree that's ordered because you don't have any relation between them, but it turns out a lot of the same algorithms that know how to walk over a graph, know how to walk over a set. Um, so, you know, in mentally sets and graphs are not that, that different when you're trying to process them. You still end up with, here's a big bag of data, I want to walk over these one at a time. All right, it's not a very good picture of a graph, but look, it's a whole bunch of points connected by things. It's like a graph. Problem with graphs is, and this is why I sort of started out with trees, is a lot, of, a lot more algorithms are easily understandable as tree algorithms. Problem with graphs is you sort of start at some point, they don't necessarily have an ordering, like you know, you do have directed graphs that say you can only go this way between point A and point B, but a lot of the graphs don't necessarily have an ordering attached to them. How do you, visit, how do you make sure you visit all the points? How do you make sure you don't just get stuck going around in a circle? There's a little bit of extra information you need on a, on a graph traversal algorithm compared to a tree traversal algorithm. If you think about tree traversal, providing you have a parent and all the, all the children in some kind of order, you're gonna say, okay, start at the parent. Let's say we're doing um, pre-order sort of traversal. Like process the parent, pick the rightmost child, pick the leftmost child, wander down that, rinse, wash, repeat. Process that, pick the leftmost child. And when I've done all, when I've reached a leaf node, come back up one level, pick the next child across, process that, and so on. I don't need a very big amount of storage there. Like I need enough stack space to store all of the parents on the stack that I process down and then I can keep processing. If I have links pointing back from each child back to the parent, I don't even need the stack space. But at that point I've burnt you know, extra storage for every child back to its parent, which is more than the storage I need for a stack for storing each parent. If I'm in a graph, it's more complicated. I've got to actually start storing because there's multiple ways to get from point A to point B. And I've got to make sure that, you know, have I visited this node before? Have I processed it before? Because you don't want to be processing the same node over and over again. Have I gone around in a circle? Pretty common. Um, if I'm in a directed graph, so I can only go, each edge has a particular direction, I can't necessarily go backwards. How do I make sure I actually process all of the nodes? Because I can't just, even, I'm, I'm sort of talking about graphs here as connected graphs. I can always get from point A to point B, no matter which point A and point B. But in a directed graph, although there can be lines between every point, I can't necessarily get there. So I've got to you know, make sure I, I start in enough different places that I process all points. So graph algorithms have a little bit more overhead in terms of um, 
auxiliary storage required um, just to make sure you, you are processing all things on really, really big graph algorithms. It's not um, too ridiculous to sort of see the, the intermediate storage blowing out of control a little bit if you try to get too optimistic. But it's nice, again, you can often split these algorithms up into um, there's a, a sort of a graph concept called biconnected components, which is if you've got every, every point in a biconnected component, there are two ways to get from any point A to any other point B. Um, and these sort of turn out to theoretically just mean they're very, very strongly clustered sets of graphs, sets of points within the graph. So you process one biconnected component, you can often then throw it away and process the next one and so on. So it turns out there's natural ways to, to build up a, a graph algorithm. I'm explicitly not going into too much deep detail here on the algorithm as much as just saying, you know, think about the data structures and look up sort of algorithms on graphs and trees because people are not, my, my sort of experience working with a lot of programmers is people forget about this stuff. You do it all in first, second year university, you sort of struggle through the exam and by Christmas of that year you've completely forgotten these things going, I'm never gonna use this again. And it's surprising how often sort of tree structures come up or graph structures come up in disguise. And I've hinted at this before, the sort of the point of so many of these algorithms is you can take a very, you're almost required to take a very narrow viewpoint of the, of the data set. Instead of looking at the whole, the whole data set at once and slipping it in and jumping hither and fro within the data, you're just processing things within a very limited view space and you completely ignore the rest of the, of the data structure. Tree walking being common, graph walking being common. Um, there's another good example I had in mind there for a minute. Uh, shells within, within um, medical situations, stuff like cancer folding and DNA graphs and stuff like that. Again, it's kind of an example of graph walking, but you've got you know, these three-dimensional models of, um, of chromosomes connected to other chromosomes, stuff like that. But they're often arranged within shells. So you, wanna, you, you only want to maybe process the current shell and its connections to the shell one further out or one further in. Um, rather than necessarily looking at the whole thing and saying how deep I'm, knowing where you are, am I six layers deep within the, within the, the shell structure or not? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you can just keep on processing things locally. Oops. The other sort of almost for free advantage of thinking about things like this is sort of local algorithms, for want of a better word. Things that only process a limited set of the data, only need knowledge of a limited set of the data at once. You almost get parallelism for free. You don't quite get it for free, you have to be a little bit careful, but parallelism comes out very easily from algorithms that have a very limited sort of knowledge required to process the next step. Now, the reason you don't get it immediately for free is think about summing a list of numbers. You have, you know, let's say we have 10,000 numbers and we're applying addition to them. To get to the next step, I start off with the first two numbers and I add them. To get to the next step, I only need the next number in the list. So I always have a subtotal and the next number. And you know, it's a pretty limited look ahead. I can do this on an infinite list for as long as I want. Problem is that I can't really parallelize that in that sort of algorithm because I can't process step 1000 until I already have the subtotal for step 900, 999. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an algorithm that works very locally but isn't subject to parallelism. On the other hand, I can do, you know, this is, if you think about, okay, I've got to sum 10 million numbers and I have a lot of friends. Let's all sum a million of them. Well, all right, I've got more than 10 friends, but all right, let's all sum 100,000 of them and then we'll combine our results at the end. That's, I've now parallelized this algorithm with the same amount of limited look ahead, but I have to do an extra combination step at the end just to bring all the results together. So there's a little bit of, um, I mean, if you, if you sort of look at the tree structure, if you think about that as a tree structure, I put all of my numbers, one to, one to 10 million in a big linked list. And I'm walking over this list, starting out with zero as my subtotal and applying plus to the next two elements and keep walking along the list. The parallel version of this involves actually putting my numbers one to 10 million in a big tree structure of some kind and say 100, 100 branches at each thing. Everyone starts at the bottom of a, starts at a leaf somewhere and just starts adding up, going back up the tree. Now I can be doing this in parallel and eventually we all get to the top and are combining the results of, of previous steps. So it's not, you know, it doesn't fall out for free, but you, you can, you know, parallelize addition, which isn't particular. That's actually kind of the gist of the whole MapReduce algorithm. You know, run a, over a huge set of data, run an algorithm, split up the data into a bunch of chunks, run the algorithm over 
a, a chunk of the data and you need a sort of well, you need a well defined starting state for this that's independent of the rest of the data. Get to the end, you have a result, and then the reduce step is combining all of those bits of data into a single thing. For example, counting, you know, you've got a ridiculous, take all the, all the books at Project Gutenberg, you want to count the occurrence of each word. All right, put, I don't know how many books there are, but put a thousand books onto each of your many, many computers. Run a process there that starts out with an empty dictionary or empty associative array of, of words and counts and just start counting, you know, as I see each word added up for the thousand books on this machine. All the other machines are doing their thousand books. At the end of this, I have Lord knows how many copies of this associative array on different machines. Now run another process that pulls all them together and, and combines them. That last process is maybe, you know, it could even do that in separate steps. It processes a hundred at a time and then processes a hundred of those results at a time and so on. No piece of data requires, no, none of these machines require knowledge of what's going on on any other machines until the, very set, until the second step. So the early stuff can just run along completely oblivious to what's going on. Um, so you, you kind of get parallelism for free there. Couple of, you know, again, this is kind of meant to be more eye-opening than gee whiz moments. But a sort of couple of um, places to look that, you know, if this does think, you know, I want to learn more of these algorithms. Chris Okasaki is a, a good name to remember. He's an um, academic in the US who, for his PhD thesis, wrote a um, very good thesis on functional data structures. Then had that published as a book called, amazingly enough, Functional Data Structures, back in 1997 or 1998, 98, I think. The book probably only has one flaw, that it uses standard ML as its language, which maybe like 13 people in the world remember now. But on the other hand, it's a fairly self-descriptive language, so it's not impossible to do. It does have a very, it does have most of the examples re-implemented in Haskell at the end. But even if you know no functional language, but you've had enough exposure to, to various programming languages that you can sort of puzzle things out, um, his book on functional data structures is well worth reading. And it, it sort of, he covers, um, he's talking about pure functional languages, like standard ML has, doesn't have mutable data types, no, no changing data, no state, stuff like that. So you've got, you know, you've got the standard problems of, if you have two linked lists and you want to append them, uh, so we have, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of elements linked together in one list and a bunch of elements linked together in the other list, we can't change the first list to point, to, so each last element points to the second list because, well, we can't change the data. And something might already be pointing to this list and we don't want to suddenly make it longer. So instead, you've got to copy every element in the first list to a, to a new version of that list and point to the, the second list. The second list doesn't have to change because no data there is being changed. It's being pointed to is not a change in your data. It's like somebody looking at you. It doesn't change you, it changes what they're doing. Um, so there's always considerations in functional algorithms when you don't have mutable data of how costly is it to change something? If I'm adding something to a binary tree, because I can't change a particular leaf node into a parent node, I have to copy that, and copying that changes what the parent points to, so I have to copy the parent and copy the grandparent and all the way up the tree. There is a consideration when you're doing the, the cost computations of, you know, I'm adding log n steps for a tree every time because I need to copy all the parents. And I can't just, I don't want to go crazy and start copying parents on the way down in case this element that I'm inserting already exists in the tree and I've just made so many copies unnecessarily in a really large tree. Uh, so he, he, he has quite a lot of discussion around that and then um, how to amortize that, those costs across. If, if I'm appending two lists, I don't actually need to copy everything in the first list and append it to the second list straight away. I only kind of need to do it on demand. As I'm consuming elements from this list, I can also be doing the copy on a time. So you don't pay a, a time penalty of n copies on the very first time when you append them, and then no cost on every other appending. You maybe pay a cost of one every time you access an element. And this is fairly important in algorithmic um, work that you don't want, sure, lots of algorithms have linear time or constant time average case, but they have you know, a very bad pessimistic case. Quicksort being a kind of obvious example that everyone hopefully remembers, sort of n log n almost always, except when you quicksorting something that's um, you know, just about already in order and it becomes n squared and that kind of sucks. And so you know, at that point you go, well, if I don't want to pay the really bad worst case time, I probably should be using heap sort or something like that. That's a little bit slower, still n log n average time, and, but the constant is a little bit slower than quicksort for the average case, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have quadratic worst case. Or I can use, you know, randomized quicksort and 
which tends to you know reduce your chances of being of being bitten by the quadratic case, but you can still get unlucky. Anyway, Chris Okazaki has this has this book, functional functional programming uh, functional data structures, which is you know, well worth the read if you're just curious. It's a it's not an easy book, but it's sort of you know it's not a thick book either. It's like you know 180 pages, that you know, well worth the read and very very mind expanding. He also on his website, and I only put it there you know, but if you type the name into Google, it's the first hit. Um, he has a whole bunch of papers he's written on interesting data structures. Um, for example, interesting ways to do um, breadth-first searches in trees for functional programming languages, again, where you can't alter things. Breadth-first searches, instead of taking, um, you know, instead of descending all the way down a, a branch of the tree and then coming back up to the parent and then doing the right tree and so on, do the, do the root and then do all the root children and then do all of the children of that and so on. And the problem here is you, if you do, imagine I've got a tree with three children, I, I process child one, child two, child three. That's all pretty easy because I'm at the root. Now I've got to go back and process the first child of the first child, so the first grandchild. But I'm over here at the third child, so I've sort of got a, you know, there's a bit of this random data structure, at random access going on. And it's not completely easy to do this. Again, if you scale this up to a few million nodes, how can you do this in sensible, in sensible ways? So here's a bunch of, you know, papers that just make you think sort of, you get a kind of a few a few sort of gee whiz moments when you're reading through these, going, gee, that's actually kind of easy. Now I understand it, and why is my brain leaking out my nose? Because it does take a little bit of effort to get there sometimes. Um, but uh, generally, a very good educator, quite a good speaker too. I've heard him sort of speak once, and that's you don't walk away with a headache from his talks, and then later on you realise that was really hard. Another good one that came out last year, um, you know, guy still fairly well known for many things, including a lot of breaking down stuff we, stuff we all kind of know and making it seem obvious and making us realize we didn't understand it. Last year at the International Conference on Functional Programming, he gave this paper on um, organizing functional code for parallel execution. And that's only half the title. It goes on. Um, why fold R and fold L considered somewhat harmful or something, I think, is the, is the next bit. But it just started to get ridiculous when I put it on the slide. But basically, his argument was he, he starts out with the addition case I did a little while, a, a couple of minutes ago, with you know if I'm adding numbers one to ten million and I'm just doing it with simple addition, it's not parallelizable because I'm actually doing this thing sequentially. What is a way if I'm getting a computer to do something like that to sort of automatically tell it how to make this parallelizable? Um, and I'll get to fold L and fold R like folds in a in a couple of seconds. But the you know he, he has quite a good discussion of breaking down a whole bunch of algorithms that seem very, very simple and are not hard to code and are inherently not parallelizable in their basic form but can be twisted around a little bit to, to sort of make them look parallelizable. And again, it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of slides. That's not actually a paper. And it's easily readable without, the, without being at the talk. I mean, I've never seen the talk, but the, the slides were understandable. The other one, which has some, you know, the Linux conference, I should have a Linux reference in there, Last year, early last year, I think. Should have probably looked at the date when I was getting the URL. Um, LWN had a two-part series on data structures in the kernel. And the first one was not relevant to this talk. Um, I can't remember why. First one was a, was a lot more sort of mutable data structures. The second one, though, was um, you know, talking about various tree structures, linked list structures, um, and so on in the kernel. Nice thing about these articles, they came with exercises at the end which is kind of rare for LWN, like it really wasn't making any bones about being a tutorial. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's sort of fairly usefully useful to read. There is, there was, someone took it out of the documentation tree. Rusty wrote one of his many unreliable guides to kernel hacking many years ago, but it got taken out in 2.5 or somewhere. Like it seemed to only be relevant to the 2.4 kernels. <laughs> right. Whose fault was that your hamster died or something, right? Yes. As dictated to Rusty by his hamster. This was, I, and you know, one of these, and I think it was the Unreliable Guide to Kernel Hacking, had a whole bunch of, you know, various kernel data structures. But I'm sort of hesitant to, re to recommend it here because time's passed. I think I read this in 2001 or something. So, you know, we've moved on since then. <laughs> it's, um, it's a shame, right? You should bribe someone to update that because it was kind of a good document. Reliable guy, yes. <laughs> Completely inaccurate guy to kernel data structures. 
Yeah. But no, the, 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 the LWN second article is at least a, you know, a flavor. And maybe go back and look at, I think it's on the, on the, on netfilter.org, um, site, the, the old 2.4 version of the, the unreliable guide to kernel hacking. Um, but just bear in mind it is two, early 2.4 kernels or something was the, the target space there. All right. Lest I go a whole talk with no actual technical content. The sort of three things that come up, and these are sort of the three, the three basic points, the three, no, points is the wrong word. Three of the atoms of all functional programming algorithms to the point that there are theoretical papers showing that almost everything can be reduced to these next three slides. Um, and, these, and this is kind of the bit where you know this, but you maybe don't know this by this name. Fold, map, and unfold. Uh, and these are kind of the Haskell words for them, but let's use those words because they're, you know, that's probably the trendy functional language these days. Fold is, I have a data structure of some kind, and a list is not a bad first data structure. Think of the, the thing on the left-hand side here is a list. Colon is the, just the, the comma, say, in, in your Python lists or um, in your, your arrays in PHP or whatever. And the, the empty looking array at the end is just the terminator. So, a lot of languages have lists much like, much like the original Lisp thing of you have an element followed by another list, which could be empty. Fold takes a structure like this and an initial value and applies the function. The function takes two arguments. It takes the initial value and something, something of the type of whatever's on the list or the data structure. And it applies, it, it starts off with the initial value and the first item or the last item on the sequence. It returns something that's of the same type as the initial value. So in this case, it returns something. F, F here is the function. Z is the initial value. So F applied to Z and 5 down the bottom returns something of type Z, which might be an integer or it might be an elephant. Who knows what, right? F can be any kind of function. And then, so now we have something that is, again, of the same as type Z. We apply that to 4 and this thing that's the same type of thing and so on. And it, it folds up all these values into a final single value. There's actually two versions of fold traditionally, folding from, and in Haskell they fold from the left and fold from the right for lists, because it, it kind of matters whether you, do you apply it to the last element of the list first and, and is the initial value the second value to the function or is it the first value to the function? Often when you're applying from the first part of the list onwards, it's the first value. This might not make a difference if f is say the function addition. If I'm adding two numbers, it doesn't matter what order I'm doing. If f is the function subtraction, it makes an awful lot of difference which order I put the arguments in. Um, there's also efficiency arguments. Fold R tends to be a little bit more efficient on non-infinite lists. On infinite lists, it has a problem getting to the end. But <laughs> on finite length lists, fold R is, is more space efficient because it doesn't have to save up a whole bunch of results. Fold doesn't just work on lists. Lists is sort of the easy way. You can make a nice diagram here, like the one I swiped from the, the Haskell whiskey. Um, but you can actually, you know, it can be applied to a tree. It can be applied to a graph even. All you need is a, a well-defined way to traverse this data structure that will be the same every time you traverse it with this function. Um, and it's a little bit harder to do on graphs because, you know, what's a well-defined way to traverse an arbitrary graph? It's kind of tough. You need a distinguished starting point or something in all of the graphs you're passing. But for a tree, it's very easy. Start off with, say, the root of the tree and then always apply it to the left tree, subtree, and then always apply it to the right subtree. Something like that. Or always apply to the left subtree, then fold in the element at the top, then fold in the right subtree. Or, pair, or children in order. I keep mentally thinking binary trees, but they could be any arity tree here. So, so fold, is a, fold is a way to take a data structure and a little bit of knowledge about that data structure. The function f has to know the type of data structure it's applying over, or actually fold has to know the type of data structure it's working over. And it folds them all up into a single, a single value at the end. So it's the reduce step of map reduce, for example. It has a lesser known cousin. Now, now oh, sorry, by the way, fold, fold is very, very fundamental. I mean, there's so many things that can be reduced to applications of fold. Unfortunately, that's, you know, it helps your understanding of fold and it kind of is an interesting academic exercise. I'm not sure it actually makes code cleaner to reduce everything to applications of fold. I mean, they get pretty long and hairy, but it is a nice, if you're reasoning about code and particularly if you're writing um, code that reasons about code, uh, it's, very, it's very nice to be able to reduce all these other functions down to fold and then all you have to teach your reasoning algorithm is how do I reason about fold? What are certain invariants of, of this fold application? 
Unfold, I was really struggling for a diagram for this one. Unfold is the obvious opposite of fold, but you know, if I give you a value, I give you 11 <laughs> a function, what, what, I could unfold it to many different things, and so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't show up as much. But for an example, it's the, the basic idea behind unfold is it takes an initial value and a function, and typically a predicate function as well, to say, you know, what is the next thing I'm doing on this value that I've got, that I'm slowly pulling things off? And I say value, but it could be, again, it could be anything, think blob of data, that somehow the, the function knows how to pull something off. It has a function for pull something off, it has a predicate function to say, stop now, you're there. Um, one example is I give you an integer and I'm turning it into a string of binary digits. Okay, the, the number, the, the function is, um, is it odd or even? Spit out one or zero. And am I there yet? Is it zero? And it just spits out a list of, of the binary, the reverse binary expansion of a number. There are other sort of cases where the, again, the thing you fold it up is maybe, I mean, you can apply fold to a data structure where the thing it spits out at the end is a tree. It's not necessarily a basic structure. And you can apply something else that takes the tree and unfolds it into a forest, into a, a set of subtrees of some kind. It, it's kind of, it's, it's, Fold is easy to understand often because it tends to do exactly the same thing. Once you work out how it walks the data structure you've given it, unfold is way more general. And so when someone sort of shows you an algorithm and says, hey, it's an unfold, you go, yeah, wonderful. What does it do? It's, it's much more specific to the functions. But again, it's a nice reasoning sort of strategy. There's also a bunch of, a, a large set of problems that can be come down to fold, unfold, fold, unfold type of thing. And if you group them as, the first fold and the first unfold, and then the second fold and the, the second unfold, it maybe is so and so efficient. But if you, if you say, okay, I'll do the first fold, then I'll group the unfold and the fold together, you can maybe introduce some more efficiencies there, and things can speed up by factoring something out into a bunch of folds, unfolds, folds, unfolds. There's a very good paper on the net by, um, I want to say Graham Hutton, but I might be wrong. I think it's Graham Hutton, um, called The Little Appreciated Unfold that's actually worth reading. It's, again, it's a little bit of, a, a little bit of hard work, but you, know, you all look like smart people. It's, it's a nice one to sort of get through to the end because it actually gives you a feeling for what this thing is doing. And again, it's, it's written using Haskell as the underappreciated unfold, I think, or underappreciated fold, maybe. It's, it's written using Haskell, but you don't have to know a lot of Haskell, really, to understand it. The final one is map, which you know, appears in a lot of languages. Map is basically, Give me a data structure, apply a function to every element in the data structure, and just apply it to that, to that element in the data structure. It, um, it returns a data structure, when, it, when it's only acting on one element at a time, it returns a data structure that's isomorphic to the thing you started out with. So you apply it to a list, it returns a list of the same length. You can give map, there are variations on map that say, okay, they take multiple arguments at a time, so you don't just give it, say, a list of elements, you give it two lists of elements, and the function you're applying is plus, so it adds the first two elements, it adds the second two elements, it adds the third two, uh, the, the third element from each list, the fourth element, so on, and returns a list of, of length equal to the, the two lists. Then you've got edge cases of what happens if the lists aren't the same length. For example, in Python, you end up with map adds nuns to the end of the list that's, that's too short, whereas zip just stops at the end of the, of the shortest list, things like that. The, you know, have your cake and eat it, depending on which way you want to go there. Um, but map, map doesn't quite have the power of fold in that it cannot reduce your data structure down to something smaller. It can take multiple arguments, but it still returns you something that's just as spiny as the original data structure you have. So map can be written in terms of fold, um, which is kind of an interesting exercise, but it, fold cannot be written in terms of map because there's no way to combine things at the end. Map is, you know, map is the one that Everyone already uses it. You know, how often do you have a data structure? You go for, for every element in tree, or you know, start at the head of the list, walk through the list, apply f to the function, put it back in the list, so on. You know, you're, you're using map all the time. And, what, and as you start seeing it as, hey, this is, you know, apply this map to, apply this function to every element in the list, then you start saying, well, okay, what else am I doing then with that data structure? Like, you know, think about it in terms of a fold over the list and combining things again at the end. Sometimes can lead you to more efficient ways to process the list. That's as far as I wanted to go there, actually. You know, I hope this just gave you a little bit of a taste of, you know, there are other ways to think about this stuff. Local, Local visibility data structures, local, sorry, local visibility algorithms, algorithms that operate only on a restricted set of the data as a whole, 
a kind of an interesting way to think about things. And it's amazing the number of problems that can be reduced to that sort of level. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's a great way to make efficient usage of your CPU cache. Even if you're not dealing in great big data structures that can't fit in your memory, it's really good for your CPU cache. Good point. Thank you. I actually meant to make that point, too. Um, yes, the local, local access has the advantage of it's case friendly. <laughs> this stuff is already, it's already there in your cache. You're not continually having to suck in more data and push out things that are already there. In fact, I, and the one I did want to mention just quickly at the end um, was there's some things like certain image processing algorithms that need to act on things in a certain space. Instead of walking across the image this way and then going back and walking across the image this way, it's often more efficient to actually wander around the image in a kind of Hilbert curve because you've already got the data here, so if you sort of wander around nearby, you're going to be back and already have that data in space, and you basically do a space filling curve around the, around the image processes instead of just going in rows or going in columns, which tend to sort of have all these cache, you get to the end here, you've got a big cache mesh, you've got to come back and reload this data. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, then thank you very much to Malcolm for his uh, excellent presentation. I hope you all enjoyed the day. <laughs>